I'm now uh, going to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Enrique M. Welna, who is a professor of history at Cabrillo College. In his presentation, Revolt on Princeton Street, Radical Activism, Housing and the Chicano Movement, he will discuss Mexican-American community activism in Southern California through the life of the Cuaron family and their part in the 1968 Los Angeles student walkout, the largest in US history. It's a real pleasure to have Enrique here tonight. Um, I recently met Enrique when a fellow colleague of his and former colleague of mine, Michelle Morton, who's with us here tonight, reached out to see if the labor archives could support primary source instruction for students at Cabrillo College with materials from our collection on the Watsonville cannery strike. Working with Enrique, Michelle, and another professor of history, Michael Pebworth, we identified a number of sources and created a Canvas module to support instruction. This was an incredibly exciting and fun project which I hope to replicate for our own faculty. When I learned of Enrique's scholarship and after reading portions of his book, I invited him to speak at our annual program. In addition to telling the incredible story of Ralph Cuaron, a member of the Communist Party USA and an activist in the Congress of Industrial Organizations and his wife, Sylvia and their family, his book is a wonderful example of how a small community archives can reveal vital local stories to those that use them. Enrique's book also demonstrates how deep the roots of radical labor activism and communism are intertwined with social justice and the Chicano movement, and how the organizing work on behalf of Mexican Americans in the 1930s and 1940s was carried forward to a new generation. It is also a perfect case study of how organizing that happens at the local level, the level of the block, the street, the neighborhood, can instigate change at the national level. The book is available through University of Arizona Press, and we'll add a link in the chat for those of you who would like to purchase the book. Please welcome Dr. Enrique Buelna. All right, good evening. My name is Enrique Buelna, and I am an instructor in the history department at Cabrillo College, uh, where I teach a number of courses on Chicano history, politics, ethnic studies, and the history of Mexico. Um, the title for this evening's talk is uh, Revolt on Princeton Street, uh, Radical Activism, Housing, and the Chicano Movement. So the focus of my talk tonight is going to be on a housing experiment that happened in East Los Angeles, a small section of East Los Angeles in 1964. And the primary personalities here, the primary characters are Ralph and Sylvia Cuaron. And they, although my book is not a, is not a strict biography, I do follow the lives of this couple pretty, pretty closely. And I, I utilize them as a, as a sort of window into this radical political activism by Mexican Americans in the Communist Party. So this is the, 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 uh, the, the basis sort of for my book, uh, Chicano Communists and the Struggle for Social Justice. Uh, but before that, what I want to do is I want to thank Tanya Hollis, right, and the folks at the Labor Archives Research Center for inviting me and for allowing me this opportunity uh, to talk uh, with you. What I want to do first, though, is uh, I want to do a share screen really quick, just so I can get to the presentation right away. Um, and I want to start off uh, here with this with this image. So I'm not going to go into into all the details. So I just want to spend maybe just about three minutes on, you know, there's a lot of history. So my book goes through a lot of history um, of, of the families of this political activism um, before we get to the 1960s. I follow the families uh, movement out of Chihuahua into the mines of uh, Arizona and, in, and, and then the migration to Los Angeles. Uh, Ralph Cuaron was born in LA 1923. Um, he lived through the Great Depression, his youthful years, and then uh, by the time World War II breaks out, he's about 18, 19 years old, and uh, he's working in the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, where he experiences discrimination, segregation, right? Mexican Americans and Blacks were not allowed to have access to training programs and educational opportunities within the camps. Uh, at least not in Riverside and San, Bern San Bernardino, and Ralph Cuaron, so he's, he's already, you know, pretty angry uh, when this happens. Um, but when given the choice between joining, joining the military and joining the Merchant Marines, he decides to join the Merchant Marines. 
So for the rest of the war, he's out on, on ships, according to the FBI file, which I, uh, I uh, had asked for a Freedom of Information Act, and I got two files on both Ralph and Sylvia. According to the FBI files, there were Ralph shipped out on many ships. And it is during this period that Ralph is exposed to the Communist Party, to radical political thought uh, and activism. Uh, and so by the time Ralph comes back uh, from the war, he joins the Communist Party right away. But any any opportunity he thought he may have had within shipping is 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 uh, is destroyed because of the heavy repression after the war against radicals within uh, the shipping industry. So Ralph goes to Los Angeles. He gets involved in the CIO and ultimately becomes a member of the United uh, Furniture Workers of America. That's where he's going to have uh, a long career. Now Ralph's career is largely in Los Angeles. He is uh, early on connected to Edward Roybal. Uh, and, and, and in other words, Ralph Baron supported Edward Roybal. Edward Roybal appreciated the efforts and the work that Ralph Baron was doing on behalf of issues of poverty, discrimination, um, and, and things like that. And so police brutality, for example. And so they, in effect, they work together. So uh, Ralph Garon would also be intimately involved in the campaign to elect Henry Wallace, excuse me, the campaign for presidency. He's not elected, he loses the 1948 campaign, but the energy that was generated as a result of that campaign led many Mexican Americans, liberal and radical, to organize the first sort of left of center major national civil rights organization, and that was the Mexican American National Association. So. There is another civil rights organization so, that exists, right? Uh, that's LULAC. The League of United Latin American Citizens was created in 1929, but it tended to be much more conservative, assimilationist to some degree. And so, um, and so ANMA turns out to be sort of, you know, this place where labor, uh, you know, activism, um, whether liberal, you know, or, or, or radical could be a part of. Uh, ANMA uh, would bring in, would allow in immigrants, would allow Spanish to be spoken, was uh, anti-assimilationist, was very critical of US foreign policy. So this was ANMA. But sadly, ANMA is not going to last. ANMA is going to be destroyed by, uh, you know, state, federal uh, uh, forces. Uh, uh, but it was, you know, an incredible and exciting organization while it lasted. Ralph Cardinal would also be involved in organizing the uh, uh, Los Angeles Committee for the Protection of Foreign Born, again, focusing on, on uh, immigrants. Uh, he would organize the an affiliate of the Civil Rights Congress, which was a major civil rights uh, and defense organization. Uh, created in 1946, and in Los Angeles, he would create an affiliate, the Mexican American Civil Rights Congress, and that's all, all Ralph. And Ralph um, would also be involved in the making of Salt of the Salt of the Earth, the film Salt of the Earth. And when I found that out, I could I couldn't believe it. I have a few images that I wanted to share with you. In this in this picture here, this image was one of the first pieces of evidence that really got me excited about this project. And this was from the Southern California Library for Social Studies and Research, a small little library uh, in South Central Los Angeles. And I spent years at this little library getting a treasure trove uh, of, of, of information uh, that I would use in my book. In this, in this picture, this, this came out of, uh, out of a local newspaper. And as I was unfolding the newspaper, essentially the newspaper was falling apart on all the edges. The paper, it was just, it, it, I created a mess on my table. But as I unfolded it here, this image came out. Now, at first, I did not recognize Ralph, but, but the image uh, identified him. So right here, right at the bottom, it says Ralph Guaron. When I found this, I, you know, I, I was able to get a copy from the, um, from the librarians. I took this to my advisor, Vicky Ruiz, who told me, man, you've got gold here and uh, you got to keep digging. And so this was just, a, just, I just wanted to share this with you. This is just a wonderful opportunity for me. This is a picture of Ralph and Sylvia Cuaron, right? So in the height of a lot of this activism in the early, uh, and actually the late 1940s, Ralph and Sylvia get married in 49. Uh, they are a mixed, uh, a mis mixed ethnic couple, right? Um, um, but, uh, you know, the Supreme Court case in Pettis versus Sharp, uh, California, the California Supreme Court allows, uh, that is destroys these bans on interracial marriage. By the way, uh, Sylvia uh, is not Mexican-American. She is uh, Jewish uh, and her family is from Ukraine. 
Um, and so she, of, of, uh, of, of her siblings, she's the only one that was born in the United States. So uh, Ralph and Sylvia make a go of it. That's uh, uh, not easy, but they, they do. This is an image that was given to me, um, shared with me by the Torres family. Now, Lorenzo Torres is here, number six. Lorenzo Torres turns out to be a, a, an important figure within the Communist Party, uh, largely in Arizona, and a mentor to a number of folks. Uh, and, um, and so he's pictured here. Number four is Rito Valencia, another important, uh, another important, uh, character, but, uh, his children would be vitally important here. Number two, you have Clinton Jenks, who's going to be a principal actor in the film. And then Ralph Cuaron. So all these folks, uh, are going to be, are, are involved at a convention for ANMA. So as, as the organizing for ANMA is going on, uh, folks are, 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 are also supporting the, the, the film. So I just want to show you some, some still shots uh, uh, in the film, Salt of the Earth. And again, Mine Mill would be a, a, a major union supporting the efforts uh, uh, in the creation of, of the film. So here's an image of Ralph Guaron. I'm going to move my, I don't know if you guys can see that, but I'm moving myself. Actually, I'm going to move myself all the way down to the bottom. So uh, here is Ralph Guaron, right? In the film, this is the eviction scene, the very famous eviction scene. This is the same eviction scene, but in front you have Rito Valencia and then Ralph Guaron is in the back. Um, here's a picture of Lorenzo Torres earlier on in the film. Sylvia and Mita, their eldest daughter, were also in the film, but ultimately get cut out, right? So they're, they're not in the film. So it's wonderful for me to find that Ralph was in this film, a film that I have known about since I was an undergrad at UC Santa Barbara. And to even think that I, was, that I would be writing about someone who was in this film was just pretty incredible. By the late 1950s, Ralph and Sylvia are, um, are still members of the Communist Party, but not so involved. There were the revelations of Nikita Khrushchev of Stalin's crimes, which really, you know, knocked uh, a lot of folks, um, you know, away from the party. Um, there, were, there was also a political fight within the UFW, uh, the Furniture Workers Union, in which Ralph challenged a fellow comrade, got him in trouble. And so Ralph, they're still members of the CP, but they're a little strange from it. And they decide to focus in on raising their families and beginning this project, this housing project. So basically the image that I am showing you here is not a picture of their home, but very similar, right? So what they did was they knocked this, their home down and in its place, they built this. Now the idea behind this apartment complex was to create uh, a, 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 a place, an opportunity for Mexican families, right, to, um, to create consciousness, political activism as a training ground for leadership, right, with the focus on social change, right, a new, creating a new generation of, of Chicano leaders or Mexican-American leaders, right, as the term Chicano is not, is not yet being used. And to some degree, right? It uh, you know it you know people seem to come and go. The the stable community that they had hoped didn't happen, but something else did happen. And at first, they didn't recognize it. But the folks that kept coming to the house and stuck around the house for a long time were young people. You know, you know, from from ten to 15, 16 year olds. Some of them were friends of the family's eldest daughter, Mita Cuaron who was, uh, you know, still in elementary school, right, before high school. And they kept coming to the house, right, staying at the house. You know, I, I have to say that part of the reason has to be the personality of the Cuarones. They seem to be a, a very, you know, a very approachable family. They seem to embrace you like you were family. Some of these kids were coming from single family homes, from, you know, from troubled backgrounds, things like that. Um, they simply just loved being there. They, they would eat there, they would hang out there, they would do their homework there and, and so on. And then Ralph took advantage, right, of the opportunity. And so since he couldn't have this other stable community, he thought he'd focus on these youth. And, uh, and man, did it work out, right? Because what he began to do was to utilize the fact that they were hanging out to teach them skills. It could be skills in, in uh in in working on car engines it could be skills in construction uh designing uh designing um 
uh, buildings, uh, but also protest, speaking, public speaking, uh, and and um, and that's exactly what happened at the house. I just wanted to see if uh, I wanted to check out which uh, the next image. So here's an image of the kids. So this is from the L.A. Herald Examiner, and this is before the walkouts of 1968. And in this image, you have the kids in front of the federal building. I believe it's the federal building demonstrating. Uh, the housing problems in East Los Angeles and he, and every single one of these kids are in this image are going to participate uh, at least most of them are going to be key leaders in the walkouts at Garfield High School so there were several high schools that 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 blew out right that that walked out during 1968 so Garfield is going to be the principal school in which these kids are going to be uh, uh, involved and so here here you are here you have them protesting in this image you see Ralph Cuadron also here with uh, kids mentoring them right as, as they're protesting some of the kids some of the some of these folks did mention to me later on that this was hard work some of them did not like doing this but ralph somehow convinced them to do it and this would all be foundational work uh in developing consciousness and developing courage here you have the kids working on scale models of the building so the so Cuaron is having them build this and they talk about this as just exciting work things that they had they had never been exposed to and ralph and silver Cuaron were exposing the kids to these things so so these are the early days before the walkouts of 1968 and the kids are being exposed to, you know, to all of these things. When the walkouts, when the schools uh, do uh, explode in protest, Ralph and Sylvia, Ralph was not there when, uh, and so March 5th, 1968 is when the, uh, the schools uh, walk out in protest, uh, over 20,000. Uh, students, high school students, would walk out uh, uh, in protest of a number of issues, right, from uh, the poor academic counseling, the high dropout rates, um, little or no preparation for college, um, cultural, uh, culturally irrelevant coursework, terrible facilities, tracking of students, um, and again, Mexican-Americans being tracked into non-college courses, uh, teacher and, and administrators neglecting them, attitudes of arrogance, uh, and so on and so forth. These, interestingly, as I was reading some of the issues of the San Francisco State College protests of 68 and 69, these were some of the very similar issues, right, that were being expressed by students. But in San Francisco, it was the college, and these were the high school students. So Ralph comes back, right, and begins to help organize. Many of the parents ultimately are going to choose Ralph to be a leader. And here you have images of Ralph sort of at these meetings and then speaking and leading. Ralph is going to be chosen by many community members to re help represent them. And in one of these efforts, when Ralph and his sister go to the, go to the high school, to uh, to to you know make demands on it on, on the principal and administrators to meet with them to figure out to see how they can resolve these issues. Ralph and Sylvia, Ralph and the sister are going to get themselves uh, in trouble. In this image, I love this image. I can't believe that they you know that they took a picture of this, but this is Ralph and Sylvia in the apartment complex with their mimeograph machine making pam pamphlets. Uh, my goodness, if uh, the police had only known, right? This is an image. This is uh, after the walkouts. These are, uh, this is a photograph, a very iconic photograph of this period. When I was an undergrad, I saw this image. I've seen this image just so many times. Never, never could I have imagined that I would, that I would be talking about uh, three people in this image um and uh, all three of them i would end up interviewing and sure enough behind here behind uh peter rodriguez is um steve valencia right ralph guaron and harry gamboa harry gamboa i would interview later because would become a, a, and is a photographer artist performing artist um in los angeles um and so uh he be in my book he talks about his experiences uh, at the Cuaron House. Uh, this is a meeting, right, at the, the school board meeting. And so uh, it's just fascinating that Ralph's image would be right there. Um, in the midst of 
of the crisis in the midst of uh, Ralph, you know, being arrested, <laughs> um, going to jail for a few days. Uh, uh, um, he is still working on the Hubbard Street project. So this is the second project, right? Another uh, uh, on the other side of Princeton Street. And this is an image of Margaret, his older sister here on the left, Congressman George Brown, who at one point hired Ralph Guaron as a field deputy to uh, help him with housing, yeah, identifying housing needs and so on and so forth, would help him with financing the first house on Princeton Street. And then you have a picture here of Micaela, this is Guaron's, um, mother uh, here, uh, 1960, probably 1968, I think I have the wrong date there. Here's an image again of Ralph Cuaron, uh, Esteban Torres. Esteban Torres would uh, would uh, become a uh, member of Congress. At this point, he's working with uh, Telacu, a major housing uh, uh, development agency, nonprofit agency. Um, and, he, and so they all end up working. At, at one point, Ralph mentored um, uh, Esteban Torres uh helping him get uh, get involved with and figuring out uh, you know his own uh you know career within within the union oops here are other images again of family members over here on hubbard street right sylvia guaron is right there here's rough uh, and sylvia and here are folks negotiating right with uh, telacu government agencies uh here's esteban torres and here's rough guaron um ralph and uh uh one of the one of the the uh the outcomes of the of the arrest is that there's going to be a trial so in 19 in uh, in 1969 the next year there is a trial that takes place and, and ralph is, and and uh, and his sister are defending themselves in in this case against the schools and the trial itself is a fascinating look at how the institutions were responding to uh, the demands uh, of students and parents in the community. And it really goes to show just how resistant they were to change. In this image, and I do want to talk about that, I just wanted to share with you, this is an image, Mita Cuaron, because she's an artist, uh, she was an artist, she, she produced this collage here of the protest movement, and interestingly, here's her father here in the center, and she is presenting this to Edward Roybal, right, so here's another picture, and this is Raf Cuaron, there's Mita, his, his, his daughter, and then here is Roybal. And here's another uh, image of the picture. But I, I did want to share with you before I finish the talk, you know, the response uh, of the court. The judge at the time, you know, was not friendly to the Cuaron, was not friendly to the teachers, to the parents, to the students, right? So they saw, and the court <clears throat> and the state saw, and the police saw the efforts of uh, these groups against the schools as an attack, an assault and uncalled for assault. And in fact, the judge admonished Guaron, calling, calling his involvement in the education of his children out of the realm of normal parent concern about the progress of his own child. Um, you know, so that's just fascinating uh, 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 to, to hear that. And for me to read it, as I read the transcripts of the court trial, the prosecuting attorney, for example, questioned the credibility of, of Ralph's assertions that the parents actually felt intimidated by school officials. Again, the prosecuting attorney basically said that Ralph was lying or, or exaggerating. He painted Cuaron instead as someone who was demand was a very demanding person, uh, a person who was bent on personal power and only having his way. Uh, so really painting a negative right and, and uh, a, a view of Cuaron and uh, and his efforts and his leadership. Right. Ultimately, according to the uh, according to the prosecuting attorney, Ralph was putting the police and the school on trial. Um, and, and and Ralph was not the only was not the only point of attack. Uh, the prosecuting attorney and even the judge attacked the children as well, or the, the young students and basically belittle, belittling them. Right. Um, that there was no problem in the schools and that these kids were simply exaggerating. Uh, if Mita Cuaron wasn't doing good in school, according to the judge, it was simply that the that Mita couldn't handle the rigor of the of the school. Right. Um, 
and 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 really that that the, the the student walkouts were a poor imitation of what was going on in terms of the civil rights movement that this was just um exaggerations that, that the kids were simply uh, this was simply an excuse to to go to to leave class uh, that the kids were were lazy and ungrateful, and in fact, the prosecuting attorney uh, says that uh, that the the students showed and expressed, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, ideas that were insulting, rude. They were uh, they were shameless and they were defiant of authority, and so on and so on and so forth. So basically, the schools, very similar to what what uh, what I what I've been able to glean from the protests and the strike that happened at San Francisco State College was that um, any any assertiveness on the part of the community or, or students was seen as a threat to the uh, educational in, uh, institutions. Uh, Ralph ultimately was found guilty. He was found guilty of disturbing the peace and resisting arrest at the school and and, and then sentenced to a short to a short uh, 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 yeah, a few days or about a week or so uh, in jail. Um, what happened with the with the with the housing project in uh, on Hubbard Street was that it ultimately failed. It fell apart. Ralph Guaron was ultimately removed from the project and by Esteban Torres of all things. Um, it didn't work out. Ralph uh, Guaron uh, would end up having to to leave as he ultimately lost even control uh, of of of, uh, of his own house as a result. That they'd, ha they'd had to leave uh, East Los Angeles altogether. But in conclusion, right, what, the, what ultimately the family left behind in East Los Angeles was a legacy of activism that would echo for a very long time, right? And ultimately, what I'm, what I was trying and what I tried to do in the book is to point out the fact that all of this activism, or much of this activism, did not come from a vacuum. That many of the young people, right, who were challenging authority at the time, both in the schools, right, uh, in politics. Uh, the military um, the situation in Vietnam, you know that 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 some of the activism right was coming right from a long history uh, of activism, uh, and that Rafa and Sylvia were part of that, and that those memories, those strands, right, had not been cut off; that they were being shared to a new generation, and that new generation, you know, in in all my interviews, quite, you know, quite frankly, admitted that they learned a tremendous amount from uh, the Cuarons uh, and others, like, for example, Sal Castro, uh, and so on. So that the experiment on Princeton Street ultimately did fail. There was no utopia in the barrio, but uh, but it wasn't a complete failure. When it did exist, it created this this life that uh, that many took to heart. That many learned a tremendous amount from. Um, some of the principals, right? Uh, at, uh, some of those who were in the house uh, would become leaders later on in their lives, um, and, uh, um, and and their memories of the Guaron house uh, would stay with them uh, forever. So that's it uh, for my for my presentation. I'm going to try to um, stop sharing here and then uh, uh, end so that we can um, so that we can talk. Thank you, Enrique. That was such an amazing talk. Um, and I don't know if people have actually seen Enrique's book, but it's quite beautiful. Um, and uh, I highly recommend it. It's very readable and it's actually a really lovely, lovely book. Um, congratulations, Enrique, on that. Um, we have uh, Leah here to moderate questions if anyone has them for Enrique, you can put them in the chat and Leah will read them out. Um, and if you have questions for me or Leah, um, we'll take those as well. And I can get us started off. Um, so Tanya just showed a picture of the cover of Enrique's book. And it's got this kind of striking red and gold. And to me, it looks really reminiscent of a lot of the like radical political posters from the 1970s. Enrique, can you talk a little bit about that, the image that you chose for the cover and what it means? Well, um, interestingly, I, um, I, so I took those ideas. I mean, I, I love all the posters from the 1920s, 1930s. 
And that's exactly what I did. I just got little bits and pieces from all that and then put it together. So that what you see, so you see that one hand at the top, that's, that's my hand, if you can recognize it, that's mine. Uh, the other hand at the bottom is my son. So I had him holding up. Uh, so I just got, like I said, I got different things and I put them together since I couldn't find anything. And here's the thing, you know, when I was in the middle of, of doing this research, um, I wasn't thinking of a cover for the book, right? Um, I was able to gather some imagery because I mean, I'm, I am also a, an artist, I love art. And so, um, but I could never find anything specifically coming from these Chicano activists. And so, um, so I just thought I'd create it, sort of build it myself. So, uh, so I actually, so in, uh, in addition to writing the book, the other part that I enjoyed a lot was the cover, so. Well, it's beautiful. I can't believe you made that. You so yeah, yeah, that. that's uh, it's marker, pen, <laughs> and uh, acrylic paint. Wow, uh, got the original in my office. Oh, fantastic! Great, we're getting a couple questions in the chat. Um, the first one is Enrique. Do you know how Quaron came came into contact with the Communist Party? So Quaron comes in contact with uh, with the Communist Party while he's out at sea. So he's a 19 year old, 20, 21 year old, and he's out at sea. He it's uh, amongst you know, his shipmates, uh, this is where he gets uh, in, this is where he gets involved. And um, they they already start forming reading circles uh, on ships. And this is when he gets introduced to all sorts of literature. And then of course, the most exciting part, uh, you know, at least from the interviews from what I was able to get was when he participated in actual clandestine missions uh, in which the CP participated in bringing over partisans who were escaping uh, Francisco Franco's fascism in, in Spain, those who were still left fighting or basically running. So the CP participated in bringing these folks on board, hiding them, giving them false papers, uh, and then taking them to, to safe ports. And so Ralph took part in that. And I think that that was an important part of really giving him a sense of, you know, this, this internationalism, this connection of workers. And, um, and I think that really left an impression on him. Great, thank you. The next question is, how have students responded to your book? Um, well, I've used, uh, you know, bits and pieces, you know, um, from my book, um, uh, you know, especially when I start talking about the, the, uh, the 1960s. Um, and I, you know, they've been able to read it, you know, I tried as hard as I could to make it as, as readable as I could. It took me quite a while. Oftentimes, uh, I had sentences in the beginning that, that lasted about a paragraph's worth. So uh, I had to figure out how to, how to, how to you know, collapse a lot of that. Um, and so, I mean, students like it. I mean, they, they really enjoy it. For a lot of them, this is absolutely new. This connection to, to older activism, to uh, you know, being passed down to a new generation of activism. I think it's, it's sort of you know, an awakening. You know, these are connections that oftentimes students don't know about and so it's kind of neat to be able to experience that yeah great there's another question um asking you what what your motivations in writing this book were um like if there was anything specific you were hoping to accomplish the process and any key things that you want um readers or this audience to walk away with well you know i will have to tell you that uh, when i uh, decided to go to graduate school i had no clue what i was going to do I so I was recruited by uh, another young Chicano, uh, Jeff Garcilaso at UC uh, Irvine. And basically the story goes that, um, and it is that uh, he had interviewed Ralph and Sylvia um, before, but uh, Jeff Garcilaso at UCI was focused on track workers. Not, not, and, and so it wasn't, a, it wasn't necessarily on the CP, it wasn't on furniture workers. And, and so what he did was he said, he basically asked me as a, you know, when I was my first year, actually my first week, what do you want to do? I don't know. And he introduced me, he said, listen, you know, we, we need more work on the CP and Mexican Americans in the, you know, Chicanos in the CP. And I said, well, you know, all right, I'll do it. And he said, listen, I got this couple and, uh, and they've got a really interesting story. Why don't you go talk to them? And that's the beginning of oral history for me, which by the way, I ended up loving. Um, uh, but again, I stumbled 
into this. And so I went and I interviewed them. And let me just tell you that every single time I went out to that house to interview them, it was an incredible experience. I left that place just going crazy. I go, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. Something new was revealed. What? You're in salt of the earth. That's impossible. <laughs> I've seen that movie like a million times, you know, and then I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. And, uh, and then finally I do find it. And then their connections, to, I, I had no clue that their daughter was Mita Cuaron. Mita Cuaron help, help was part of the movement of students at Garfield High School. And then it turns out that when I went back to look at the, the footage from the walkouts, there she is in the <laughs> film. I go, oh my God, I can't believe that. Um, or that uh, they would be involved in, uh, in uh, the, the campaign for Wallace. I mean, it, or the, the participation that Raf would be a part of the creation of, of uh, ANMA, the Mexican-American National Association, a major civil rights organization. I mean, that was exciting. So, and then here's the other thing about this couple is that I love going to their house. <laughs> You know, it was, you know, they would serve me food, <laughs> coffee. No excuse, that would be really important too. Oh, especially uh, most of the time I was starving. And so, you know, pan dulce. I mean, it, they really, the, the personality it was just incredible. So warm, so inviting. It's like, I couldn't even leave the place. I mean, they would, I, honestly, I would go there and I would spend like three hours with them. So, so, and, and then later to, figure out that their their memories were pretty incredible because everything checked out when I when I would go to the archives and then find them there and that was really exciting and so uh so you know uh, so really the story unfolds and so right away I began to realize that these folks had incredible influence especially when I started interviewing a lot of the folks from the walkouts I always got the same story they learned from this couple, they learned from this house, and they took that knowledge into their organizing in the schools. And so the story just wrote itself, really. I didn't, I was, <laughs> I didn't do anything, really. You it can was take already a little there. bit of credit because it's yeah. <laughs> a complicated story. Are there more questions? Yeah. Um, um, wow, there's a lot more questions. Yeah. So, and I have another question too about um, you. You discuss the house on Princeton Street as a kind of utopian project, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the significance of utopian projects and movements for social change. Well, I don't know how much I can I, I can actually talk about sort of utopian movements. Um, but um, I think that this idea of creating this space um, that that could uh, it, it, that could produce um, consciousness, social consciousness, uh, a place where you know where you could develop this leadership, and that this leadership would have an impact on society. Um, was exciting for Ralph. Ralph had been involved in reading about these issues and how housing uh, could be used as a catalyst for this. And, um, and he got excited about that. I knew very little about this. Um, he had been reading some books. They gave me the names of some of these books. It turns out that in the 1950s and 60s, there was a lot of talk about this. Um, also, Mike Davis uh, talks about these in his book. I, one, one of my favorite books from him was A City of Courts. And so, um, you know, he talks about these utopian societies. Uh, uh, and so Ralph was, uh, was pursuing this goal. Um, didn't turn out exactly the way he, he, he had envisioned it, but it still was very interesting. And, uh, and then the fact that I have photographs and I put one of them, a few of them, well, some in the presentation and some of the book where there are, there are the pictures of these kids. And, um, and then interviewing some of these young people at the house and listening to them tell the stories. Yep, that's how it happened. It's kind of like, wow. Um, and and, and uh, yeah, the, the, the utopia didn't work out. I think that it was a lot more complicated, right? <laughs> I think you needed to have a lot more, you know, there need to be more management skills in terms of money and so on and so forth. And it became, it became uh, uh, unwieldy, a little crazy. Um, and then when your dream clashes with sort of modern concepts of, you know, capitalism and, and uh, 
uh, it didn't work out all that all that well. But 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 that consciousness, those those discussions, those reading circles, those coming together, creating family, that did happen, and that was exciting, and uh, and it had a tremendous influence, and it would have an impact. So, I don't know if I've answered your question, but thank you. No, I think you have. Um, okay, so the next question is that uh, about Ralph and Sylvia's work um, within. It, did their work intersect with the labor movement in Los Angeles? Um, did they leave the Communist Party or stay in? And if they did leave, um, did they go on to work with other uh, progressive organizations? You know, it's interesting because when I would ask Ralph, you know, so what happened? Did you end up leaving the Communist Party? His response was, no, I didn't leave the Communist Party. The Communist Party left me. <laughs> So, so in other words, he sometimes felt that he was, you know, that, uh, that he was so radical that some people felt uncomfortable. So there were some problems, right? I mean, Ralph tended to be, um, you know, he, uh, he would, uh, uh, I don't want to say do crazy stuff, but what I'm saying is that he would uh, take risks and he challenged authority even within the CP. And so he didn't follow directives he didn't you know and 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 uh, could be sometimes critical um i don't think they left the party but but certainly um they uh got themselves in trouble right sometimes for not following you know <laughs> the directives of certain leadership uh wanting to do things on their own questioning that authority questioning policies um, but still, there were many within the CP who, who just loved the family and believed that, that Ralph and Sylvia were doing the right thing. And so, and so they, they, were, they were never too far from the CP, from the party, or from labor, from organizing. And even when Ralph got himself in trouble with the UFWA um, during, uh, I think it was about 1955, when he challenges one of his own. For leadership, uh, uh, for the leadership for, I think it was going to be, I forget the, the position, but he challenged a, a CP uh, individual who had long history uh, within, within the Communist Party, and uh, Ralph was close to winning, but he loses. And in that loss, he ended up getting a lot of people pissed off at him. Um, but he seemed to always be okay with that. Well, if they don't like it, well, too bad, you know, and you'd go on to other projects. Okay, thank you. There's also a couple questions about... Um... You know, if if there was any red baiting, if um, what effects of the FBI's maybe Coentel Pro program had on the Quran family and their organizing, or if you can speak a little bit to, I know you had the um, their FBI files from a FOIA request. If you can talk to a little bit about the surveillance of the Qurans. Well, um, so Ralph and Sylvia knew that they were being followed. In fact, the FBI several times uh, approached them. Uh, in reading the file, uh, you see some of the agents actually mention that. Um, and uh, but Ralph would ignore them. The, the, the way the way that they would ignore would be to sit, they knew who the FBI was. I don't recall exactly how they figured that out. Maybe it was the way they were dressed. But when there would be a knock at the door, Ralph and Sylvia would simply um, lock that door and take off through the back. <laughs> That's what they would tell me. So boom, pick up the kids and they're, they're gone. Or if Ralph was, um, if they would come up to him uh, on the street, he would, he, he knew how to handle them. I mean, he, from my, from my, re, from my interviews, they would, um, they would simply ignore them. And the FBI file seems to suggest that, that attempts to try to get Ralph either to talk or, or to, uh, you know, give information and Ralph wouldn't. Um, but uh, my sense is that Ralph and Sylvia knew how to handle the FBI. All right. Um, I think maybe we have time for one more question. Um, can you uh, speak a little bit about Ralph's role in the Chicano moratorium? Well, see that, that, you know, my, um, by 1970, I don't have any sense of Ralph uh, involved in the Chicano moratorium. By 1970, he's out of, by 1969, the end of 69, he leaves East LA. He loses both of his houses, both, well, he loses the project on Hubbard and he loses his own house and he takes off and they're in, and they're in Riverside in San Bernardino. So my sense is, is that there's no more involvement uh, of the Cuarones. Um, uh, and, th and there's no information that I have uh, of them being involved in the Chicano moratorium, but that would that would come, you know, pretty right away. But, but 
right away, but now his life and the life of the family are now out in the mountains, out in Hemet, okay. <laughs> way out there. So. Wow. So thank you. Um, great questions from the audience. Um, I don't think we even got to all of them, but uh, it is seven o'clock. Um, we're going to put a link again to Enrique's book so you can purchase it. Again, I just want to say it's incredibly readable. Um, and I, th I think it's a beautiful homage to a family, um, even more so than, you know, the history of the Communist Party in LA. Um, but I also just want to thank you, Enrique. This is really a lovely talk. And um, I'm really grateful to have had you here tonight and to have had the opportunity to meet you and work with you on this other project. Um, so thanks for coming. And thank you very much for inviting me. This was, to me, this was a lot of fun. And thank you to everybody, for Leah, Catherine, Sam, everybody. Uh, and of course, you, Tanya, for, for inviting me and for getting this thing. I think this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Great. Um, and we're going to just drop another chat uh, link in the chat in case you would like to donate to LARC. We'd appreciate any help we get. Um, but thank you all for coming. Um, I know that, you know, we love to be in person at Local 34. <laughs> so hopefully next year we'll see each other face to face again. Have a great night.